Sheila Beladinjat. Is is that correct uh, pronunciation? Yes, that was that was good, Tobias. Thank you for having me. Thanks. It's very nice you can uh, join me here. You have a lot of experience in um, doing due diligence and in software de uh, development. Um, and you also have some uh, very good inputs, I think, on uh, open source and closed source AI. So that's why I was very eager to uh, speak with you. Uh, maybe you could uh, put a few words on your own background and your experience. Sure. Um, so I am a technology consultant. Um, I have been in this business for over 20 years now. Um, in the past few years, I have been working more closely with investors conducting uh, technical due diligences during the mergers and acquisitions phase. Um, and I help assess the software side of their target company um from an end-to-end -end perspective whether it's their software architecture infrastructure uh, the people and processes and so on everything that relates to the development of software um and yeah i also advise um on ai uh, strategy and adoption digital transformation and so forth so that's uh my my technical background in the field yeah and what are you uh, currently working on um, I, I, <laughs> I'm a little bit um, um, uh, overwhelmed by giving talks nowadays. I, I find myself traveling quite a bit to uh, near and far for um, speaking engagement opportunities, um, going to um, be, being a jury member on uh, challenges and hackathons and pitching events and so on. I enjoy working with the younger generation. Uh, entrepreneurs and um, you know there's a lot of um, activity going on in Munich right now um, and uh, Germany and especially uh, Bavaria is very much investing in um, developing uh, the ecosystem of the startup community here and I found myself um, enjoying being part of that uh, community and supporting them with various activities. So you have many years of experience in what you do. Um, what are some of the most common questions you get from uh, clients? I can understand that one of your main focus has been the merger and acquisitions among uh, private uh, venture firms. What are the common uh, questions you get and especially also um, concerning AI? Yeah, sure. So, um, a common question from investors is, is the AI of this company for real or not? Um, and also, so they want to know, is it for real? Is it unique? Are there any intellectual properties associated with it? Or is it just coming from the open source community? Um, what are the barriers to entry for other companies and people for this particular, you know, product or service and, and, and whatnot. So that, that's one of the most common questions. It's funny that I often also get a question of, is it scalable? Um, and why is it funny? It's like sometimes scalability is actually not relevant to, to the company and, and, and the product or service and whatnot, but, but it seems like it's a popular uh, term for them to use. And um, so, so yeah, that scalability, and, and scalability doesn't necessarily mean from a technical perspective, we also need to look at the scalability of the companies from the, um, the team the, that are supporting it, you know, the developers, the testers, the entire uh, organization and, 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 and so on. And I'm curious, uh, especially concerning the open source, closed source uh, debate. Just uh, yesterday, it was announced that uh, the French AI company Mistral AI have engaged in a partnership with Microsoft, which is famously OpenAI's um, uh, computing resource partner. Um, and I'm curious, um, Mistral's new a uh, large model all, almost have the same capabilities as uh, GPT-4. So overall, do you think this is surprising? Do you think it's positive or negative that a European AI company 
starts um, and Mistral AI has famously um, been an advocate for open source, at least uh, publicly. Um, do you think this is a good development? Is it surprising? What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, at the risk of sounding like a politician, <laughs> I, I don't have a particular opinion as to like, okay, is this good or is this bad? I think that, um, you know, I, perhaps it's what my job uh, dictates to, to be um, objective in everything that I approach in uh, analyzing and being objective. So with everything, there's a pros and cons. With open source, there are, there are pros and cons and also with... Um, proprietary AI is what I would call it, um, that ha also has its own challenges and risks associated with it. I think it's too early to tell what the motivation is behind this, given that uh, Microsoft is also heavily invested in open AI. Um, but uh, my gut feeling is that open source community, having that transparency, having the community uh, being nimble in terms of being able to identify the vulnerabilities and address them and so on, you could end up with having better solutions from the open source community coming up because everyone, you know, is contributing to it and there could be hundreds or thousands of people contributing to that as opposed to the closed so source uh, or um, uh, what do you call it, the proprietary uh, where there's a you know certain number of people and perhaps not so um, vetted out, let's say, because with AI, as as you well know, uh, there are so many scenarios to cover. There are so many you know tests that need to be done. For example, we just had the recent um, fiasco of Google and the uh, Gemini. And and so uh, and and the issue associated with that that seems like it was not well vetted out, right? So perhaps these kinds of situations can be avoided if we go with an open source community. But again, it's what's important to companies like Microsoft and, and other big tech companies is to make money, and perhaps uh, open source is not such a money maker for them. So did I sound like a politician? <laughs> I think it was a decent answer. Um, <laughs> I think you, you had some good points. Before we get further into it, first of all, how would you even define open source AI? I know, for instance, that the Meta's model, Lama, um, they claim that it's open source, while um, open source uh, communities claim that it's really not. What's your, uh, do, you, do you even have any uh, definition on what open source is that you um... use? Yeah, I, I think open source is the code that is accessible to anyone. So you and I can become developers and have access to it and, you know, use it. That, that's open source in my book. But there are actually various different licenses associated with open source. And that's another thing that, you know, there is a misconception that open source means free. And that is not, you know, the case sometimes is sometimes when if you make modifications, you change the licensing agreements to these open source code and, and so on. So it's not um, black and white. There, there needs to be a, a good understanding of what the terms and conditions with any code is. And, and in, in the article that I recently published on LinkedIn, I actually went over uh, the different types of licenses uh, for open source community and whatnot. And it's good to pay attention to that because this, you know, potentially down the road when it comes time for investment or acquisition could turn into a red flag if best practices are not followed. And I follow your point that it's not really possible right now to tell whether Mistral's um, new partnership with Microsoft is positive or negative. It's a, it's a somewhat superficial uh, question, I suppose. But to me, it does seem like a bit of a hit to the uh, open source um, philosophy or uh, what's the right word for it, the open source um, uh, argument um so mistral ai has been very prominent uh, for their open uh, open ai software and now they're engaging in a partnership with microsoft 
So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, what do you think the future is for open source yeah. AI in the next two to five years, let's say? Do you think yeah. they'll stand a chance? I, I understand your point. You're saying like, you know, the, why are they making a deal with the devil? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> because uh, I think the mentality um, that I see with open source is good or is bad and, you know, or proprietary uh, code is good or bad. And we're polarized in our opinions. If you look at Twitter, um, you see all these tweets, you know, and, and the discussions that happens amongst people, you're either pro or against it. And I, I think it, we, we need to blend the two, to be honest with you. So with open source pra you know, um, practice, it doesn't mean that you can do whatever you want to do and you can give the code to whoever you want it to uh, without any guardrails, um, without any responsibility in doing it in a way that could minimize any harm. Uh, currently, we don't have good measures in place for open source to minimize harm, you know, we could uh, launch something and somebody could misuse it for, you know, intentional uh, purposes that are not beneficial to society. So where are the guardrails around that, right? So, and then on the other hand, we have the proprietary one uh, where um, we assume we have better guardrails in the proprietary closed AI. And that is a big responsibility for the company to implement that. However, who's monitoring? How do we measure it? Measure it? How can we ensure that the, the policies and the regulations are being followed, right? So th there's a dilemma in, in both. And I, I wouldn't say one is good and the other is bad. I think perhaps we should develop some better tools and mechanisms to make all of this work better for us and why not use technology to do that, right? So for example, when it comes to regulations, when it comes to building a framework, it's so difficult to keep up with as a consultant. You know, I see there are regulations coming out of the US, there's, you know, coming out of Canada, the EU AI Act, you know, which is very difficult to understand in terms of how do we implement it? This is the question. I get from my clients all the time, okay, so there are some rules and regulations and policies in place. How do we ensure that we do it right? There is no good answer for that. We don't know. And AI is evolving so much and it's going on, you know, fast and furious. It's hard for us to keep up with the ever-changing things. What you and I are talking about today in a couple of months or maybe in a, in a, in a matter of weeks, it could become... Uh, obsolete and not relevant anymore, right? So it's it's very difficult to keep up with that. But I think it is possible to utilize technology to help us better uh, assess these, you know, various situations and react to it. I see. And um, in terms of regulation, what do you think is um, best to regulate? Is it open source or closed source? Both things have. Um have uh, advantages and disadvantages. Right, I, I think any kind of AI needs to have some guidelines on what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. So it doesn't matter whether it's open source or not, we need to ensure that no harm can be done with the AI. And I think that's the essence of it. But I do understand it's very difficult to build regulations around the emerging technologies, especially AI. Um, and part of the challenge is that our regulatory bodies, I think, you know, uh, you were asking me about this before with the article published in the IEEE spectrum, where they were talking about is open uh, source dangerous or not. And uh, the author of this article was recommending that we have more nimble regulatory bodies and to make them more nimble we need to give them the proper tools to be able to do that so currently in any country that you look defining rules and um, regulations and policy takes months and you know multiple stakeholders are involved in the process is very lengthy it could be months and oftentimes years 
So how can we, you know, take that system and apply it to this? And we're all screaming about, oh, this is wrong and this is bad and bringing out all the flaws. But I don't see so many people coming together and saying, how can we help our regulatory bodies to do a better job? What can we equip them with? Why don't we digitalize some of these processes that they're engaged with? Why can't we even democratize some of these things when something new pops up where we could get the vote from the people? Do we have the tools and the means and the technology to enable that? And, and we should utilize it. You know, this is a great innovation opportunity for us here to you know look at this and find ways to help uh the process go through smoother because like it or not progress happens technology develops and and people you know innovate and we need to find a mechanism to keep up with that rather than always feeling like we're left behind and we're trying to catch up right we need to be part of that uh, innovation rather than than always playing the catch up and i suppose uh, open source ai makes it easier to um, democratize ai and for everyday people to have an opinion on how things should develop um, and so forth i suppose one of the issues with uh, the large ai companies that develops uh, cutting edge models is that people like you and me and even democratic institutions have very little control and insight into what is really going on behind those uh, stone walls. We don't really know. Is that something that might concern you? Um, yes. Um, you know, just a while back, I was reading something. So I'm originally from Canada and I read something that, you know, we're calling it voluntary code of conduct for companies to follow the AI best practices and regulations and whatnot. And I think that voluntary uh, concept needs to change a little. So we need to have more transparency in that process. We we have control over the food of what we eat, for example. There are uh, regulations in place um, and uh, th there are regulations in place for many things that could be harmful to people. And, you know, AI is not just software it has multiple dimensions it has multiple stakeholders it impacts people's life their livelihood you know for example now with i was talking to an artist uh just recently and he was concerned about his job and he was saying that you know the tools that are becoming available to the public my job will become obsolete and how do i keep up with that who's looking into this stuff right who is looking into making sure that we don't leave anybody behind in the progress that we're making or how you know how can we integrate them into this progress and have them join this journey right great sheila i think you gave some uh, really good pointers I actually think I will cut it short and just um, stay with this. So it was really nice uh, talking with you. And uh, where can people uh, find you? Um, I'm heavily active on social media, especially on LinkedIn. Um, so it's, you know, if anybody wants to connect with me, they can just look me up, Sheila Valadineshad. Um, and I would love to hear from your audience if they have any input into what we discussed or if they need any support when it comes to better understanding the open source best practices, um, which, you know, to be uh, honest, it, it's quite funny that after so many technical due diligences that I have conducted, I see very few companies actually having a policy in place for open source. So my advice to your listeners and anyone who is interested in using the open source, I don't see that as a negative thing when I do uh, tech DDs. It's actually, I say it's a smart way to go. Why reinvent the wheel if you can use open source? But let's make sure that, you know, they have best practices in, in mind and, and uh, keep an eye out on the security and um, license vulnerabilities and so on and, and follow some best practices, which they can find some pointers in my LinkedIn article related to that as well, if they're interested. Thank you.